week one of college football is almost in the books here. And it was an exciting day full of plenty of surprises and plenty of things that we already knew. But the stars really were on full display this weekend. And we're going to start with a Big 12, Pac-12 matchup that went a way that a lot of us outside of a certain school didn't expect. TCU in Colorado was the game that I think a lot of people expected, including myself, to go TCU's way. And there really was just a matter of how many points would TCU score. And that clearly could not have been further from the truth. Colorado found a way to show everyone that they are a a legitimate team in terms of talent, in terms of their skill set. Their stars shine bright. And Deion Sanders has done a phenomenal job of getting this program already back into a place where they can move on from the past. They can forget about the horrendous years we've seen in the, in the last few seasons. And it shows that so far his ideas, his strategy of rebuilding the program is working. His ability to bring in new talent has made Colorado drastically different. And there's a lot of things that we can talk about today in terms of what did they do well. And I think the first thing is you talk about the talent that he brought in. First, he brings his son in, obviously, and Shadur Sanders had an explosive game, set a school record for 510 yards, passing and four touchdowns. He was one of the best players on the field. And honestly, you can make an argument that the three best players on the field, at least, were on Colorado's side. And Shadur was just one of them. I think a lot of the attention also went to Travis Hunter, and for good reason, the fact that he played both sides of the football and played really well. I mean, there were times where he looked gassed, but he played really well on offense. He played really well on defense. He had an interception on defense, had over 100 yards receiving, and PCU struggled. Their their DBs really didn't have an answer for Colorado's offense, and Travis Hunter was one of those players making them look foolish. I think the underrated part of this even within the star talent was Dylan Edwards. I think that he'll get a lot of love over the next few years. His explosive play was probably uh, another one that we can talk about. And we'll talk a little bit more later, but this offensive line for Colorado offensive line play was a big reason why Shadur had so much time to throw. Now there were times where obviously Shadur made plays happen, but he had so much time to throw. He looked really comfortable in the pocket and that allowed him time to throw, get the ball to his playmakers. It all also allowed the rushing attack to do its thing too. So the the guys up front deserve quite a bit of recognition as well. And they capitalized on TCU's mistakes too. TCU's two interceptions were critical. I think it couldn't have come at a worse time. And that was the biggest difference in the game was the two turnovers. I think TCU moved the ball fairly well and I don't think that there were too many concerns maybe early on they struggled but I think that they proved that they can still score they can still score points but they got to take care of the football Chandler Morris has to do a better job of that but I think the biggest thing to point out for both teams and yes Colorado is is riding high and for good reason this is going to be a very exciting team but defense was kind of optional at times yes they didn't make those two interceptions and that was really good but you also gave up a ton of yards and a ton of points. Now you can make that argument that it worked for TCU and it works for a lot of teams. And if you're going to pick one, obviously you would probably rather have an explosive offense than a defense that maybe is opportunistic. You saw, even you look back at 2017 UCF, that was a team that was very explosive and a team that wasn't exactly elite defensively, but they made the most of their opportunities when they were provided them by the other team. So picking off passes, creating turnovers, is definitely something that helped Colorado in this game. The offense obviously was not a problem. These two teams put up points in a hurry. These two teams were, I think, really fun to watch. If you're, honestly, you look at yards per play, Colorado had seven yards per play, and TCU was right behind them at 6.8. So that's going to be something that these both these teams will be really good at. I think that they're still going to score points. And obviously the season's not over for TCU, but the biggest thing was the offenses were able to do what pretty much whatever they wanted outside of the turnover. So that is definitely something that impacted this game. We talked about Dylan Edwards before and his ability to make an impact right off the bat. 
surprised a lot of people. I think outside of Colorado, we didn't really know what to expect. And that's probably on us. But Dylan Edwards was so much fun to watch. 159 total yards, four total touchdowns. There were a couple of plays where it looked like it was just going to be a normal play with not much behind it. And then all of a sudden he breaks free and is in the end zone. I don't think that the it's early in the second half, that touchdown really got things going and, and c- continued the success for Colorado. TCU obviously had its own success. I think that they're set at the running back position in Manny Bailey. 164 yards. Trey Sanders only had 46 yards, but did have three touchdowns. I think that TCU's offense is still really, really good. And I don't think that they were the problem today outside of obviously those two picks, but you can't really fault the the unit as a whole. I think that they did their part for the most part and same with Colorado. Colorado did a phenomenal job of, of putting points on the board and then hoping that their defense can get an interception or two. And that's what they did. And then you obviously look at the quarterback battle, and this was one of the keys coming in. Is I, We all knew that Colorado was going to be talented offensively. We all knew that they could they were going to score points. It was just a matter of what that defense is. And if I'm a Colorado fan, I'm really excited about what I see offensively, but I'm probably equally terrified of what this defense could be if things don't go well. And we'll focus on the offense for now because we can't speculate about how bad or good the defense will be going forward. We just can acknowledge that this was a up and down performance by that defensive side of the ball, but they made it, they made the most of their opportunities. They were provided opportunities to make plays and they did. Shudder Sanders had a phenomenal game, 510 yards. Like we said, four touchdowns. I think the best thing is that we all knew Shudder could play at the power five level. And he goes to Jackson State originally and then comes with his dad over to Colorado. And it was just a matter of how do they handle the transition? How does this roster handle that? They're playing with guys they've never played with before. Most of these players have never played with maybe they have probably played maybe with two or three guys. But outside of that, there's not a ton of players that know each other. So the fact that they were able to win today was even more impressive. And that adds to I think a lot of people in the preseason being concerned about Colorado is you just don't know what you're going to get. And including myself, we're, we're so wrong. And it was just fun to see a program do this. Cause we've, this is unprecedented territory. I don't think that we've ever seen it before. And it's fun to see what this Colorado team can do. Now, can they do that in the future? Can they do that in the long run? I'm not sure, but I think for now we got one heck of a show and Chandler Morris An okay game. You'd like to see, obviously, those interceptions. There were a couple of throws that he made that were questionable. You didn't really like the decision-making. So that's another thing that you maybe wish you could take back. But a guy who still played, I think, really well at times, still showed that he can be a solid quarterback for TCU. And then it's just a matter of, again, taking care of the football and doing what you need to do to help your team win with keeping the ball with your offense because again your offense is going to score points and if your defense needs a little bit of help then maybe there's more pressure on you but that also means you definitely cannot turn the ball over so this was a fun game i think the other thing that you look at Shadur, you look at dylan edwards the travis hunter thing like i said i don't know how long the experiment goes with him playing both sides of the ball i think he's super talented and i think that he can do it but i think at the next level you're looking at someone who's only going to play one side of the ball so it's just maybe you put him in for packages because he's obviously effective. You saw him play really well in this game, but I think that at times he was gassed. And yes, it might work in the short term, but long term, you're just going to set him up for maybe more injuries. You're going to maybe lose his efficiency because he's trying to do so much at the same time. So it was fun to see, but I'd also worry about his health long term and maybe kind of reel that back a little bit. Maybe just give them a lot early on, see what works, and that's maybe what they're doing, but then kind of peel that back. But nevertheless, Colorado stuns everyone with a huge win over TCU on the road to get the Deion Sanders era started, and we could not be more surprised by this program. Fresno State got their season off to an incredible start with an upset win over Purdue, and for those of us who have followed the Fresno State program, it shouldn't really be a surprise, and especially with what we expected from Purdue. I think that you maybe thought 
this could go one way, but I, I think that this program needed a little bit of time. So we'll dive into that a little bit here. Fresno State is a team that is no stranger to pulling up upsets against Power 5 programs. Just ask UCLA how that goes when Jake Hayner was still there. The, the Bulldogs play the game with no fear, and it doesn't matter what the score is. It doesn't matter who's scored or what the deficit is. They will bounce back. And I think that the perfect example was it was 21 to 17. Purdue gets the kick return for a touchdown to put it 28 17 and Fresno state doesn't go anywhere. In fact, they bunker down, they dig their feet in and they just come back and fight. And it's really fun to watch this program because you look at a team that lost quite a bit of talent and they are trying to just recreate the magic that you had under previous players. So I think that one player we have to highlight is Mikey Keene. And we'll dive more into his, his play later in this video. But Mikey Keene was one of the best additions in the transfer portal already. Now, maybe that's an overstatement. And really, week one is all about overreactions and just getting really excited. But Mikey Keene appears to be a great fit for Fresno State. And his go-ahead touchdown was kind of familiar to what we saw when Jake Hayner beat UCLA. The, the comeback or the, the back shoulder throw was very, very familiar. And that was really fun to see. Now, on the Purdue side of things, Deion Burks had a huge game. I thought he was... Very impressive. His ability to make big plays, he just torched Fresno State's defense. They had no answer for him. But in the end, you're looking at a Fresno State team that does not fear our five opponents. They have no – I don't think they have any awareness that they're supposed to be the underdog, and that's what makes this game so much fun because Fresno State is very exciting to watch. They're a fun team follow if you haven't followed them and now the big 10 knows that fresno state can not only beat pac-12 teams but they can beat big 10 teams as well and i think if you're if you're ryan walters that's not that ideal start to your tenure as a head coach but i think that this wasn't really a surprise when you look at what purdue had coming back you lost a ton of talent and i think that Hudson card obviously needs a little bit of time to get used to this new system but he was okay. I think that your your defense is really where you had concerns. A lot of people were concerned about what this Purdue defense could do in 2023. I thought that they maybe needed a little bit of time to get going. And, you know, there's a reason why you bring Ryan, Ryan Walters in and what he can do for this program to be able to elevate them. The biggest thing is his impact on the defense. And it's going to take some time. It won't happen overnight. But you obviously don't want to take too long because then games like this happen. And like I said, the offenses weren't necessarily the problem. Purdue's offense was pretty decent. And, you know, Hudson Card didn't put up the biggest numbers, 254 yards and two touchdowns. But he made some really nice throws. And sometimes it's all about just getting your playmakers the ball and letting them do most of the work. And I think that he did that really well. I think that he was a exciting player to watch because you almost at times too, you kind of forget about him because you just give it to a guy like Dion Burst, let him do most of the work, but he did make some nice passes. So there is something to be said about that. He just got outplayed by Mikey Keene. And I think one of the best things for Mikey Keene was his time at UCF when he got to play. I think that his ability to play for the Knights helped him in this moment because it wasn't him taking over for the first time. It wasn't his first start. It wasn't his first action. He knew what to expect. And he knew that even though I'm in a new system, he knows that he's going to take hits. He knows what that feels like, and he knows how to play. And I think that he goes into Jeff Tedford's system, which is a better fit for his skill set. Now, Gus Malzahn system, not exactly a passer friendly system. So you come over to Tedford's, offense and you saw the results already what does that mean long term i think you're looking at a guy who can replicate what jake hayner did maybe even be a little bit better that's probably an overreaction after one week but the numbers are really exciting it's 366 yards and four touchdowns i didn't expect that from mikey Keene. i thought he was going to be good i predicted that fresno state would win this game i thought that they would be able to pull off the upset I did not expect this type of performance from Mikey Keene. I thought it would be more of a team effort and maybe Keene makes a play or two here and there, but he did more than that. He was absolutely phenomenal and he was a, a big reason 
why this team was able to win. And you kind of have to tip your hat to Purdue because they did whatever they could at special teams, offense. You, you tried everything and Fresno state just kept coming back. And Keen was a big reason for that. And we saw his best skill set on, on display. You saw him throw on the run. One of the best things that he can do is throw on the run. And you saw a really good blend of his ability to throw passes st- standing in the pocket, rolling out. You saw a lot of exciting things. And his favorite target was Eric Brooks. Eric Brooks had a huge game, and I did not expect that from him. I thought he'd be more of that possession receiver that you get pick up first downs when you need it, average 10, 12 yards per catch. But nope, nine catches for 170 yards and two touchdowns. He was a big-time playmaker for Fresno State, and Purdue had no answer for him. And obviously, Fresno State didn't have any answer for Deion Burks, but I don't know what to tell you other than you got to just go back to the drawing, drawing board and figure it out because both sides obviously have things to work on. Both It's week one. Everybody's going to have things to work on. Everybody has some good things that they can point to as well. But Fresno State pulling out the upset, not really a surprise to me. Surprise to Purdue fans probably. Surprise to a lot of people that pay attention to maybe just kind of the power five surface level kind of teams. And the group of five isn't on their radar, but Fresno State, if they are on your schedule, you definitely have to be worried about the potential of an upset. And Jeff Tedford's squad proved that tonight. What a great way for Washington to start the season. A big win with a 56 to 19 win over Boise State. We saw an offense that we all expected to be explosive do exactly that. And we'll dive into more of the details for both teams here. We start with Washington, obviously. Michael Penix Jr. got his Heisman Trophy campaign off to a good start, 450 yards and five touchdowns, a big game for the Washington Huskies quarterback. And when you look at this team, you knew this offense would be explosive. You knew this offense could put up points. And it was just a matter of, honestly, like pick your score, how much. And with the depth that they have at wide receiver, you knew that he would have options downfield. You lose Cam Davis at running back for the year, so that obviously hurt the rushing attack wasn't really a huge factor, but it didn't exactly need to be because of the passing attack. Now, when you look at this passing attack, not only is their performance exciting for this game specifically, but long term, I think you're looking at a a group that could be a nightmare for everyone in the Pac-12. Romeo Dunze, Jalen McMillan, and Jalen Polk all had big games. And when you look at their production, it tells you one thing. It's that or tells you two things, actually. First, that all three are really good. All three can be the lead receiver at any point. And two, that builds into this point of if you lose one of these guys, you should be just fine. And there were other guys that stepped up, didn't have the uh, biggest games like they did. But you just proved that, hey, any one of these guys can be a beast for us. Any one of these guys can go off at any point. And that's scary. That's scary for the rest of the Pac-12. That's scary for anyone that faces this team. And Boise State found out the hard way. Now, Boise State did make some nice plays on defense. It's just that there were they were few and far between. You're looking at a defense that has talent and just got exposed by a better team. They just got dominated by a passing attack that at times looked effortless. I think that Michael Penix Jr. looked really comfortable in the pocket. He didn't really have to take too many hits, and he didn't have to take too much time to find his receiver. He just locked and loaded and let it rip, and the results really speak for themselves. And you look at his production, it tells you everything you need to know. Now, on the flip side, Boise State has a pretty talented quarterback themselves. He's not on Michael Penix Jr.'s level, but Taylor Green really struggled to start the game. Two interceptions in the first half wasn't ideal. He needed halftime in the worst way, and I think that you're looking at a a team that is – I don't know. It's just hard because this doesn't feel like a team that can lose 56 to 19, but at the same time, that's how good Washington is. And Boise state now can go back to the drawing board and figure out what do we need to do to get better? What went wrong? What do we have to fix? And Taylor green is going to be part of that solution. Didn't have the best game, but he's going to be a reason why Boise state is still tough to beat. They have plenty of teams that they can send a message to, and the Mountain West is still very much up for grabs. It appears that it's going to be deeper than we expected, especially with teams like Hawaii and San Jose State and Fresno State putting on the performances that they did. 
you're looking at a conference that is going to be tough. So Boise State can't dwell on this too much. Taylor Green just needs to figure out a way. Because when we talked about this preview, we knew that Boise State needed to throw the ball. And if you can't throw the ball, you're in trouble. And what happened? Boise State couldn't throw the ball, and they struggled. Now, in the offense's defense, the defense struggled just as much. They averaged nearly 9.3 yards per play for Washington, so that's not exactly going to help you win football games. That will make your life very difficult, and obviously it doesn't help when your offense can't score points and your defense spends more time on the field, but I don't know really what to tell you when you're just nothing's going your way. Washington obviously was the better team. They proved that, and there really wasn't much that Boise State could do. Now, on the other side is we don't really talk about Washington's defense. They are talented, but, you know, I think that they did their part too. They didn't maybe have the best game, and, you know, they were overshadowed, obviously, by this offense. But this is still a defense that will – it's probably the X factor for this team. And health in the defense will be the biggest X factor because they have some players that have had injury issues. And if they're able to stay healthy, then it just comes down to can this offense continue its blistering pace and can the defense step up when they need them? Now, when you're looking at specific players that had huge games, Washington's passing attack takes up most of the spots because you look at 450 yards passing and five touchdowns. You just know you had a good game. 450 yards is nuts. And we talked about the trio before Romeo and Dunze, seven catches, 132 yards and one touchdown. Dylan Polk, three catches, 101 yards, one touchdown. Dylan McMillan, eight catches, just under 100 yards with 95 and two touchdowns. So the passing attack obviously was the highlight. The one highlight where Washington struggled for Boise State's highlight is Ashton Gente. We all knew that he had big playability. We all knew that he had star ability, and we saw that on full display. We saw him, and we actually saw Boise State use multiple running back sets, and they actually would line up Gente in like a trip slick or in the slot. So now they have unleashed a new weapon that should terrify not less teams or any team that faced them. I mean, Washington didn't have an answer for him. 14 touches, 153 yards. And two touchdowns, probably the lone bright spot for this team. And that was really fun to watch. He, I think he's a special player. I think that he could have a major, major impact on this offense. And then that helps out his quarterback, too. Because when you look at Taylor Green, we all know Taylor Green could run average over seven yards per carry last year and struggled to run the ball this week and then also struggled to throw the ball. 19 of 39. 244 yards, one touchdown, two picks. Again, Boise State's success will pretty much go where Taylor Green takes them. If he's able to be an effective passer and open things up for the rushing attack, then I think that he'll be a more effective runner. And then guys like George Halani and Ashton Genty will be able to find more running room as well. But until then, you're going to have an offense that relies on the rushing attack, and then you have to figure out how the, the passing attack works. Now, I will say, in Green's defense, there were times where, I mean, that at times he had nine straight incompletions in the first half. So you think, oh, well, he's just very inaccurate. And I don't, I think that he was, yes, inaccurate through 20 incompletions. But I also think that he was very close to making some big plays. I mean, there were a couple deep passes that he threw that went off the fingertips of his wide receiver. So it's not like he's really missing. Like you're not missing by two, three yards. You're missing by, a couple inches so you're you're finding ways to get better that's a way to get better find a way to connect with those big plays that will take some pressure off you and off this offense but when you're competing against a guy like michael Penix, you have to be perfect you have to be efficient and green just simply wasn't that when you're going against a guy who's thrown for 450 yards and five touchdowns green kind of contributed to that by throwing interceptions and not being able to connect with his receivers but that's something that you can fix. Boise State obviously has a lot of work to do. They face a Washington team that wants to be in the playoff, that wants to win a Pac-12 championship. And obviously it went Washington's way. But I think both teams still have a bright future going forward in 2023. Another game that I was wrong on, but also knew that it could go this way. North Carolina beats South Carolina 31-17. to I think that the way that this went down was kind of unexpected. A little bit. I I think that the talent level on North Carolina's side was there. And we've talked about North Carolina in terms of we knew their offense was really good. We knew they had depth. We knew they had talent. Defense also had talent, 
But for the last few years, their talent and experience has kind of underperformed. And that was not the case tonight. I think that, yes, there were some inconsistencies and there's some mistakes that they made. But North Carolina did a lot of really good things. And it was really the defense that stepped up the most. The front seven finished with 16 tackles for loss, eight sacks, and held South Carolina to negative two yards rushing as a team. That is it, a tremendous performance from a unit that, like I said, has had talent in the past, but just hasn't stepped up when they needed to. So what do you do to elevate your team? You find ways to capitalize on the talent you have. You find ways to elevate yourself and you find ways to turn your experience and talent into results. And that's exactly what they did tonight. And that helped an offense that at times looked really good. And then also had made mistakes. There were a couple of turnovers that Drake may, you know, Drake may throws two interceptions And then what does this defense do? They respond with tackles for loss, sacks. They get the ball back to their offense. And if they can do that consistently and the offense finds a way to be consistent as well, then you're looking at a team that is going to return into the ACC championship game and maybe looks a little bit stronger than they did last year. One of the things that we'll look at the offensive side of the ball, British Brooks returns, and which really – there's a part of you they could say, well, that doesn't really matter because they have so many running backs. But he had 103 yards rushing. He was clearly the the best running back tonight for North Carolina, but there's still plenty of talent behind him. So he's definitely going to have to continue being consistent and finding ways to contribute and be productive because there are guys waiting for their opportunities. But it was really fun to see him return. On the South Carolina side of the things, I think there were good things at times. The really exciting thing was Beamer ball. The onside kick to start the second half was one of the more exciting plays in week one. It was really fun to watch, but it, you know, it just didn't really turn into anything long-term for South Carolina. We'll talk more about their player performances, but everyone made mistakes and North Carolina was no exception to that. With Chip Lindsay taking over the offense, we knew that there would be some mental lapses. We knew there'd be some confusion. And we saw that early on. We saw penalties. We saw timeouts needed to be taken. Just miscommunication. And that's to be expected. But I also think that leads into coming into this year, the concern was what does this offense do? Can the scheme be as explosive as Phil Longo's system? And that's still a question. I think at times you saw when Kobe Pacer was torching South Carolina's defense and we didn't see Drake may hit him every single time, but you're looking at an offense that should be still explosive. They should be able to move the ball with relative ease. And at times we saw that and at times we didn't. So this is a group that can still take a step forward because when you look at the numbers, they're not super explosive. I mean, North Carolina averaged 6.2 yards per play. So there's something to be said about how good they can be. And with the talent level they have, it just comes down to Drake May making better decisions and offensive line giving him time to throw and open up running lanes. So I think that this is a really good group still. South Carolina obviously needs to figure things out. The offensive line had a nightmarish day facing this front seven of North Carolina, which is maybe concerning because of the conference you play in. You're going to face a number of talented teams that have – disruptive front seven so what do you do to improve after this because it's gonna be a long season if you're not able to capitalize on your talent because there are guys that played really well and there are guys that struggled and there wasn't really much of a blend down the middle there weren't a ton of guys that were down the middle to balance things out so that's concerning now when you look at the quarterback play this had the potential to be a an explosive battle between Drake May and Spencer Rattler. And at times, both of them made really good plays. I thought they made a number of big throws that were really fun to watch. But in the end, it just it never turned out to be the exciting matchup that we wanted it to be. I think that part of it was Drake May was still figuring out this new system, made a couple of poor decisions, and then Spencer Rattler just never had time to throw. When you get sacked eight times, it just disrupts all chemistry you might have. But when you look at what the rest of this team did, I don't think that you can really point at Spencer Rattler as a weakness because nobody really else really stepped up outside of maybe like Xavier Leggett. I think that his game was was really good. But when you have 
guys like came on Rucker for North Carolina in the backfield constantly. It's hard to get anything going. And came on Rucker had a huge game, eight tackles, five and a half tackles for loss, two sacks. I mean, what more could you ask from one player? And he wasn't the only one contributing. And he was a, a guy who definitely led the way, but this was a front seven, a defensive line too, that was absolutely phenomenal. And we're starting to see what North Carolina could be if everything gets pieced together. So Again, North Carolina looks really good. South Carolina had some moments, and both teams have things to work on. That's what week one's all for is you finally get on the field. You know it's not going to be perfect. You know you have things to work on, and North Carolina starts the year with a win. South Carolina starts with a loss, and now it's back to the drawing board. Figure out what you need to do to get better. How can you improve? And in the end, it's – Still a really fun win for North Carolina. You have to build upon this momentum that you have from this defensive performance and then hope that your offense can make less mistakes as well. And what was one of the uglier games of week one, Houston and UTSA went back and forth in what ended up being more of a defensive battle than anything. And there are concerns for both sides, but there are also some positives to take away from this game. And we'll start with what was a disappointing performance from Frank Harris Three interceptions is not something we expect from him, and some of the decisions he made were simply uncharacteristic of him. I don't think we've ever seen him struggle this much or make that many poor decisions. That He also had a ton of pressure in his face, and I think that he was just trying to do something and got really frustrated with the lack of success early, and that creates some poor decision-making. And overall, it's just an ugly game. 31 total points isn't exactly the barn burner that we envisioned, and especially with the amount of talent you had returning on both sides of the ball. And it's not just UTSA. Houston's offense at times was good, but then also it was like, what are you doing? Like, I don't know what, what happened with this team. I don't know what happened with this. This is year five of Dana Holgerson. It's, you have five years of experience here, and – you have 17 points to show for it. Now, I'm not saying that they should have blown UTSA out of the water, but you should be better than this. You're going into the Big 12, and you wonder why people think you're going to struggle this year. And I don't know. Donovan Smith at times looked looked pretty good. He made some throws that you're like, wow, he, this, this guy is going to be really fun to watch. But then you're also seeing uh, some, some poor throws. I think also this offensive line just like – what are you doing? I just, you're, you're giving your quarterback maybe one second to throw. He's always running and yes, he can run, but you'd rather him run by design and not out of necessity. And it was just really tough to watch both of these offenses the, you have to maybe tip your cap to the front sevens. The defensive lines really were disruptive and that's a big point for both teams. I think both defenses stepped up and, in a big way and I think one concern I have for Houston going forward is what is the status of Josie Nwankwo? He went down with an injury early in the game, and UTSA attacked that right away. That was a big success for them. Kavorian Barnes gashed this team up the middle. And what does that look like for this team long term? Is he out for a while? Who's going to step up in his place? How do they make that better? And I think that they did in the second half find a way to plug that hole. And you're looking at a team that was opportunistic. They found opportunities to pick up passes. They capitalized on Frank Harris's mistakes to the tune of three interceptions. So that is something that you can tip your cap to Doug Belk. Yes, the offense wasn't doing his part, but the defense could have just folded as well, but they didn't. They found ways to be successful. They found ways to limit this UTSA rushing attack to just 101 yards. Yes, they lost the yards battle. I mean, UTSA was still able to move the ball, but at the end of the day, they were able to create turnovers, and that was the biggest difference. Three turnovers by UTSA to zero for Houston. So that was something that was really nice to see, but this is still a team that needs to get much better. And it starts with both teams. It starts with the quarterbacks. Donovan Smith, 233 yards, two touchdowns, 31 yards rushing. No touchdowns on the ground. Frank Harris, 209 yards, three interceptions with one touchdown, 45 yards on the ground. Frank Harris, I think, also is dealing with something. He's, I think you saw the wrap on his leg. He's, he's dealing with some sort of injury, which he won't use an ex, as an excuse. 
but it's probably something that affected him. He was probably unable to move around the pocket as well as he wanted. He probably wasn't able to run it as fast as he wanted as well. And that affected things. But then again, you also look at this, this front seven for both teams and they were disrupted. UTSA specifically, Donovan Smith had very little time to throw. And that is a testament to how good this front seven will be for UTSA and the AAC better be on notice because this team can play. And Trey Moore is one of those players. He didn't have maybe the biggest numbers, but he did have two tackles for loss and one sack. Houston did not have an answer for him. The other guy that was really effective was Dadrian Taylor. Three tackles for loss, one sack. So this is a group that clearly made an impact on the game. They were able to disrupt what Houston wanted to do, and that really gave them opportunities. It kept them in the game, first of all, and it gave them opportunities to put more points on the board. It's just that their offense didn't exactly help them out. So... I think when it's come down to it, Houston's, I don't know. I, I don't I don't know what Dana says to this team to get them motivated. I don't it, it's just it seems like it's the same problem every year where it's you just don't look like you want to be there. You just don't look like you want to compete. And you your team like your team just embodies that. You just look flat coming out the gate. You play down to the level of your competition, and that's not going to help you in the Big 12. You're just going to get boat raced by everyone. And that's, I mean, UTSA is unfortunate that they lost this game because, honestly, they they played like the better team for a lot of the game. And the turnovers didn't help. But Houston's lucky they're not 0-1. And they definitely need to figure things out because there's too much talent on this roster to not put points on the board to not win football games more comfortably. And that's on Dana Holgerson. He's got to figure that out. And if he can't figure that out, it's a reason why everyone thinks he's on the hot seat. And it's only going to get hotter if he doesn't figure things out and get his team to play better. The Preston stone era began at SMU. And I'm really excited about what this team could be in 2023. So when you're looking at week one, you don't want to overreact obviously, but why not? Who cares? It's week one. We obviously know everything's wrong. I mean, Colorado beat TCU this week. Like, did anybody expect that outside of Colorado? No. I, I think that anybody that thought that was just guessing. They had nothing that proved it with everything that go on, goes on. Why not overreact? We're already overreacting to everything. And I think the SMU fits into that category, too. And maybe there is some foundation to that to build upon. Red Lashley has done a phenomenal job of building offenses everywhere he goes, and Preston Stone is the newest beneficiary of his system. 248 yards and three touchdowns just to get things started. The offense was very balanced. That With 248 yards passing, 209 yards rushing, they didn't really need a ton to put away Louisiana Tech. But again, we knew that this offense would be good. We knew that they could score. Every single year, though, for SMU, it comes down to what does the defense do and today we got a little bit of an answer we saw them take a step forward we saw them contribute they held louisiana tech to 28 yards rushing they also had a pick six that is something that you need to see from smu more frequently now they're not going to hold every team to 28 yards rushing i doubt they'll ever do that again unless they faced a really really bad team but I, I think that they're capable of making more of an impact than we've seen in the past. This is a defense that has talent. They brought in talent from the transfer portal. They have talent returning. So they have the ability to do it. It's just a matter of actually doing it. And we saw that against the Louisiana Tech team that struggled with FIU last week. And now they faced a much better SMU team this week. And we saw the results. I mean, the yardage itself was the biggest discrepancy, 457 to 269. The yards per play were obviously another factor as well, but this is definitely a lopsided win, and it should have been from what we saw coming into this game. And I think it starts with the quarterback play and the, the differences between when you have similar numbers, but it turns out a different way. And Hank Bachmeyer is not a slouch at quarterback, but tough day, 21-33, 241 yards in one touchdown, which those numbers aren't necessarily bad pick and then it's just the lack of time to be able to make big plays that was the biggest difference is that smu put pressure on louisiana tech and it felt like smu itself its offense had plenty of time to just do whatever they wanted and 
that is something that will help them in the AFC. It'll help them when they face tougher competition. But putting away teams that you're better than is also something that you need to do. And thanks to Preston Stone, who really didn't have to use his legs at all either, that's something that is huge. If you're able to just throw the ball, let your playmakers do the job, that's going to be something that will get you pretty far. And that's really what they did. We saw some new faces making it back. Texas A&M transfer LJ Johnson Jr. had a big game, 128 yards, one touchdown. PCU transfer and former SMU commit Jordan Hudson only had two catches but took it for 72 yards and one score. I think that this team has the potential to be really explosive. This team has the potential to be a very, very fun team to watch. Um, Finally, a team that can maybe win an AAC championship. It's not going to be easy especially for what we saw from Tulane today. We saw a team that is going to be difficult to beat. SMU is one of those teams that's gunning for them, and you have to find a way to play consistently. If you can keep building and stacking wins and good performances, because we've seen SMU score a lot of points in the past, but struggle defensively. We have saw them, we, we've seen them in the past just do things where it's like, yeah, that makes sense, but then the other side of it, the negative side of it also makes sense. Oh yeah. They're really good at scoring points. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They're, they're going to give up a lot of points themselves. They're going to, they're not going to get a ton of turnovers. They're not going to get extra possessions. They're just going to try to outscore that team. And it feels like maybe this year could be different if they're able to get that defense to step up because this offense is going to score points. They will put up points at a blistering pace. It's just a matter if their defense can do its part or not. And if they can, AAC championship is a very realistic goal, and this will be one of the best offenses in college football. But if the defense can't do its part, then you're going to look at finishing any, anywhere between seven and five, down and three, and wonder what do we need to do once again? What do we need to do that's different that's going to get us to that next level? And maybe that's this year, maybe it's not. But for now, you started one and oh, you have things going on the right track. And from here, you build upon the mistakes you made and find ways to add on to what this positive result is. And finding a way to do that with Preston Stone and make him a better quarterback, make this team better, is what will get them to that next level. The Drew Aller era began with Penn State this weekend, and we already saw a reason why he is better than Sean Clifford. And that's not to say Sean Clifford didn't do a lot of things for Penn State, but we saw some things from Drew Aller that there, there are things that Sean Clifford just can't do, and it's just strictly from a talent level. And, yes, it's it probably an overreaction to say that uh, Drew Aller is better because he beat West Virginia, but we can't just say that it's West Virginia, and we'll talk about that more in a little bit. The first thing that I think you point out – is the red zone struggles early in the first half. I think that Penn state had a number of good drives that didn't end in touchdowns and they should have, they just, this offense just sputtered, but it's also week one. So you could expect some of those things. You expect some of those shortcomings and those struggles. And then it's just a matter of how do you fix those going forward? Because I mean, you have to give credit to West Virginia. They did everything that they could to keep this game close. And in the end, they just weren't the more talented team and Penn state, Flex the muscles a little bit more, and they were able to do what they wanted to do. But West Virginia's defense, you honestly have to tip your cap to them because they made life difficult for Penn State at times. Now, Penn State obviously made a number of big plays, and they pulled away in the end. But West Virginia is going to be tough. And if Neil Brown goes out, he is going out with a fight. He is going down with a team that is going to make life Difficult for anybody they face, and that includes Penn State. Now, Drew Aller played a huge role in today's game. And the first pass, we're just going to talk about the first pass right now. His first touchdown pass, he's dropping back the pass. There's pressure on him. He stays calm in the pocket, eventually steps up, and he doesn't look to run right away. He is still keeping his eyes downfield, and he makes a throw 30, 40 yards downfield, throws a rope. And it it wasn't like this guy was wide open either. There was a defender there. He throws where only his guy can get it on the run with pressure and completes it for a touchdown pass. So he's already done stuff that Sean Clifford can't do. And it's just one of the many things that we'll talk about this year. That's what's the difference between Penn State's offense now and what it was before. And it's going to be Drew Aller's ability to make plays that Sean Clifford couldn't. 
Penn State's defense also showed why it will be a big factor and one of the best in college football. And Garrett Green is definitely going to be sore tomorrow. You look at some of the plays they made in the second half, this was a defense that was just hammering Garrett Green. They were hitting him every which way, and West Virginia's offense couldn't get much done. They could not move the ball, and it was pretty evident. You look at the the ability to throw the football, Penn State thrived in that category, and West Virginia didn't exactly do that. So I think when you're looking at the difference between these two teams, I think West Virginia, even though Penn State averaged 7.3 yards per play, this is a defense that is much better than we think. I think that this is a group that plays really well together, and they just, it, you know, it's almost like at times Ben don't break, but also at times they can be disruptive. And Penn State's kind of exactly what West Virginia needs their defense to be. Penn State is that defense that will – not bend they, they don't bend they just simply don't give up yards they don't give up touchdowns and they go don't, don't give up anything and that's what west virginia wanted and that was the difference here is penn state can shut down offenses and west virginia is eventually bends a little bit too much so this is a team in penn state that has big goals for a reason and you saw some really good things right off the bat now capitalizing and putting more points on the board is probably one of the things that you can do to get better and your quarterback can help. And I'm saying Drew Allar was good, and you're looking – I think that you're looking at a guy who will make this offense better, make this program better, but you're also looking at a guy who can help his team put more points on the board because field goals are fine, but against certain teams like Michigan and Ohio State, that won't get the job done. You will not be able to win football games by kicking field goals against Michigan. And that's saying that with – a defense like Penn State's. But Drew Aller is one of those players that can make an impact. We saw, we talked about the first touchdown pass. We know he can make big time throws. And I mean, he had he had a good game, 325 yards and three touchdowns. So I'm not trying to tell you that he didn't have a good game. He's a problem. He's a good player. He will make an impact on this team right off the bat. He will be a one of the best quarterbacks in college football. And based off of what I've seen already, he has the talent to do that. But that I guess if you're trying to nitpick what to – because nobody's perfect in week one. There's no such thing as being perfect. And if you're going to pick something that Penn State needs to get better at, it's putting more points on the scoreboard when you're close to the end zone. It's not settling for field goals inside of the 20. That shouldn't be a thing. And finding ways to do that. Now on the flip side, West Virginia's Garrett Green, I, you know, his numbers passing weren't great, nor were his numbers rushing. But there were some times where he made some pretty impressive plays. His athleticism – was on full display, and you saw a reason why he could be really exciting in the Big 12 this year. West Virginia has a lot to play for this year. They have a lot to compete for, and their quarterback embodies that. Now, the combination of a, of Green and C.J. Donaldson has the potential to be really exciting. It was fun to see C.J. Do Donaldson back on a football field again, 90 yards and one touchdown for him. And I think that this group could be a, a fun group to watch. It's just a matter of how many games can they win if they're not as talented as everyone else? Because they're going to play talented teams in the Big 12. So we'll see. I, I think that you went against a Penn State team that was simply just better than you, more talented than you, and we just saw that in the result. There was no – there's probably nothing that West Virginia could have done to win this game. There wasn't anything that anyone expected them to do to be able to upset – Penn State, and it, you saw that. Keandre Lambert-Smith torched West Virginia's defense for 123 yards and two touchdowns, and there's four catches. Curtis Jacobs on the defensive side of the ball led the right. Chop Robinson had a, a good game, too. This is, again, the game went exactly how we expected it to go, but I think both teams have things they can build upon and work towards next week. They can get better. They can find ways to improve, and then they can work on – building momentum off the things that went well because there were good things that happened for both. There were bad things that happened to both. But Penn State has bigger goals. Penn State is looking to make a college football playoff appearance, win the Big Ten, and they took a good step forward to make that happen in 2023.